from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Karen Heller, National Features Writer for the Washington Post, a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. The Library of Congress has been the festival's host since its inception 16 years ago. We want to thank the co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and the many National Book Festival sponsors who made this event possible. You can support the festival with a donation by checking the information in the program. And there will be time for questions after the talk. Harlan Coben is big. <laughs> Literally. Since 1990, he has written 30 books that have sold, and this is a fact, reporting folks, a gazillion copies <laughs> in uptillion countries. Okay, so he sold more than 70 million copies in 43 languages in more than 100 countries. Harlan, how can he not be a writer with a name like this, born to dance on the spine of a book? Is the first author to win the Edgar Award, the Seamus Award, and Anthony Award, which means he writes mysteries very, very well. Harlan comes from that most exotic, intriguing, and art-inspiring land of enchantment, New Jersey. <laughs> That's true. Nobody should put New Jersey down for anything, because Maryland and Virginia cannot claim what New Jersey can. And we can go into that at another time. He is a guy from Newark, New Jersey, a distinction he chairs with the literary bard of that city, Philip Roth. He still lives in New Jersey, unlike Roth. He is also admired by the French. His bracing 2001 thriller, Tell No One, was made into a terrific French movie, Ne le dit à personne. When Coben was nine years old and living in Livingston, he met a self-confident kid in a catcher's uniform who approached him by saying, Harlan Coben, hi, I'm Chris Christie. What nine-year-old does that, Coben asked years later. The lifelong friends disagree on the single most important issue of our time. Which Bruce Springsteen song is better? <laughs> Christie argues it's Thunder Road, and Coben swears it's Jungle Land. For the record, Coben is right. Also, if I may indulge, I have a mystery idea for him. Perhaps your next thriller could be on the nation's busiest bridge mysteriously closing for some traffic study the first day of school. It, it's just an idea, but I'm giving it to you for free. <laughs> In 2013, he has so many honors. Coben was inducted into the Little League Hall of Excellence with Chris Christie. That same year, he was also inducted into the New England Basketball Hall of Fame for his hoops glory at Amherst. In college, and this is quite amazing, folks, he was a member of the Psi Upsilon fraternity with Dan Brown, who also knows how to craft a best-selling thriller, and shared a freshman dorm hall with David Foster Wallace, who certainly knew how to footnote. Coben's new book, Home, published this week, has ace detective Myron Bolitar investigating high-profile kidnapping of two young boys a decade earlier, when only one of them returns home. He was also at the first National Book Festival. Bolitar is six foot four, not Bolitar, Harlan. <laughs> Bolitar is six foot four, like his creator, and a native of Livingston, a former basketball star, a sports agent turned sleuth. Also, perhaps most compelling of all, he is considered quite attractive to women, despite being saddled with the name Myron. Readers, friends, Harlan Coben. Uh, just got to adjust this a little higher. There we go. Thank you, Karen. That was really good, man. It's almost like a roast. I was afraid. I'm getting a little nervous sitting here. Hey, how are you guys? Good. It's so great to be back here in, uh, in Washington, D.C. I don't know how many of you know it. I was actually born um, just north of Washington in um, Newark, New Jersey. So it's, uh, it's a thrill to be back here amongst my, my people. Thank you very much. So the book just came out. It came out on Tuesday. I do have a copy of it over here. Um, 
And so when the book comes out, the book's coming out on Tuesday, and I usually do one of those morning shows first thing. So this year, I, do, I did the um, CBS morning show with, um, with Gail King and Charlie Rose, and people are always wondering what's the best and the worst part of being on those shows. The worst part is the teaser. Like, have you ever seen, they, they do is they stick a camera right in your face, and you're all in the room, and they're like, coming up in our next half hour. And you kind of don't know what to do, and you're sitting there, and you're adjusting things. But the best part of being on those shows is, I get to wear makeup. <laughs> I look so good with makeup. <laughs> Seriously, I glow. I, I, I don't know. I, so when I do it, I'm actually tweeting this sort of thing. I'm like, wow, I look so good with makeup on. I don't know what it is. They're like, do you want to take a wipe and wipe it off afterwards? I'm like, are you kidding? I'm wearing this all day. I look great. And suddenly I have four kids. I'm getting like emergency texts from my kids, right? Stop tweeting about makeup. If you follow me on any of those things, you will know which ones my kids are, because the reaction to any picture I usually put up is either one of three things. Can you not? Don't. And all in caps, STOP, like in emergency things. In fact, in fact I, I don't normally do impressions. I'm, not, I'm more known as an author than a guy who does impressions, but I'm going to do a quick impression for you now, because when the book first comes out, I'm lucky enough to get a, a full page ad. My publisher gives me a full page ad in time with a big picture like this on it. Yeah, no, embarrassing. So you can imagine my teenage daughter's joy and pride in seeing her father's picture in the New York Times this big. So here's my quick impression. It's my kitchen table in the morning. The newspaper article is out here. My daughter is coming down. She's going to see her father's picture in the newspaper as she's going to school. Here it is. Ew. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, oh, I gotta share. Don't tell my wife I'm sharing this with you. Okay, I stole this. I stole this. I know. We'll get to we'll get to books in a second. Don't worry. I promise. We'll talk about books. But oh, I have to share this with you. So my, well, it's an actual example of writing. It's actually a great example of writing, because writing you're trying to sum things up in a way that's entertaining and economical, right? So I'm about to, I, I snapped this off my wife's phone. It's a text exchange between mother and daughter. Just mother, daughter, mother, daughter. And I think this is what I mean. You will see their relationship in just these four quick notes. Let's hear, okay, so let me read it to you. And, and don't tell my wife. <laughs> All right. Um, mother, why are you home? Daughter, stomach wasn't feeling well. Mother. Oh, mine too. Diarrhea? <laughs> Daughter, bye. <laughs> Do you get the relationship? Do you see what I mean? That's the wonderful thing sometimes about writing. Okay, I'm here to talk to you about healthcare. No, I'm here to talk to you about <laughs> how to write. What else? Am I, I have nothing else I can talk to you about. So I'm going to try, actually, if I can, to show you how I write the novels, and then we'll take a few questions. And please have a raise your hand, because if you don't raise your hand, I'm just going to call on you. <laughs> and not all of you have done the reading. Remember that? <laughs> Throwback, right? Um, so so uh, first, my, my Surgeon General's warning. Um, you may not like how a novel is A novel is a little bit like a sausage. You might like the final taste. You probably don't want to know how it was made. That being said, here we go. So the first question we always get is, where do you get your ideas? Like there's, a du like there's a boutique on DuPont Circle that sells them, you know what I mean? And the truth is, anything can stimulate an idea. Tabloid headline, boy 16 becomes grandmother, marries Ed Asner, you know what I mean? Like anything. You just, you, you walk around all day with your mind as open as it can be, and you ask yourself, this is the key to all writing, what if? All the time, what if? And every once in a while, ideas get stuck in these hooks in the brain, and they sort of stay there. So I'm actually going to try to tell you how I've come up with a couple of the book ideas um, as a, a, to, to illustrate this. So um, a few years ago, I wrote a book called Promise Me. And the idea for Promise Me came, um, to be a little bit serious here, um, I, I overheard a couple of teenagers talking about drinking and driving. And I pulled them aside and I said, maybe some of you have done the same thing, I bet. Promise Me, title of the book, you won't get in a car with someone who's been drinking and driving. Here's my phone number, I don't care if it's 3 in the morning, I don't care what you're on, I don't care where you are, I'll come pick you up, I won't tell your parents, just promise me you won't get in a car with someone who's been drinking and driving. Now in real life that's it, and the story never called. But fiction writing's asking, what if? 
What if some, uh, some, a girl in New York City calls my heroine, after makes a, uh, my hero, after makes a promise like this, he drives into New York, he picks her up, he drops her off at what he thinks is a friend's house, she's gone. No one sees her ever again. What if? That was the start of Promise Me. Hold tight, friends confessed to me they were worried about their kid, um, teenage boy, 15, so they put spyware on his computer to monitor what he was doing. Part of me was uh, repelled by that part of when he was like, well, you have to watch your kid, but most of me was like, this is a cool gray area and I can make a book out of it. Again, what if? What if they got a message that completely changed their lives? Now, the problem with these two examples is it sounds like it took me about 10 minutes to come up with these ideas. This is three months of work, ladies and gentlemen. This is three months of sitting on the couch going, no, honey, I can't throw out the garbage. <laughs> I'm working. Can't you see I'm working? Hardest part of my job, convincing my wife I have one. <laughs> the other problem with this example is it doesn't quite get the mind frame of how your mind just sort of wanders and jumps around. It's kind of like, have you ever had one of those nights you can't fall asleep because you're trying to think of something? Something really stupid like, you know, what's the name of the dog on Petticoat Junction? You know, you sit in bed and you're wondering what the heck the name of that dog was. There's Bobby Joe and Billy Sue. Who's that dog's name? And then you're wondering, why am I thinking of something so idiotic? And you try to trace your thoughts back, you know, it's like bouncing all over the place, and you actually started with something completely different. You actually started with something like, uh, why doesn't Burger King serve Mountain Dew? You know what I mean? Like, your mind just kind of bounces about the place. That's sort of a better example, I think, of how it, you come up with an idea. And I'm gonna to try to now put that into another, uh, one, another example. Um, I wrote a book a few years ago um, called Tell No One. And the idea for Tell No One came at me from two different directions. Okay, one, um, and this is what I mean by anything can stimulate an idea. I was watching a really crummy romance movie on TV. I won't mention the name of the movie, Message in a Bottle. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> love Nicholas Sparks, good friend of mine, but that movie. Anyway, what struck me about that movie was, it's a story we've seen a few times, especially the ladies will, will, will know what I'm talking about, where the man loses his wife, right? The wife dies, the man loses his wife, and he can't go on. And then a hot babe walks by and he's fine. Have you noticed that in those movies? In that case, it was Robin Wright. It's that kind of movie. And I said to myself in those moments, I get serious. What about the man who can't go on? What about the man who's truly lost his soulmate? Is there a way I can find redemption for him? That's one part of the idea. Second part of the idea is I lost my parents at a fairly young age. Yes, I get sentimental and overwrite Myron's parents. That's what I imagine my relationship would be with my parents if they survived. If you don't like the parts, skip them. They're my therapy, okay? Just leave me the heck alone. <laughs> But one day, um, I was thinking the same way we all do. Wouldn't it be great if my parents were still alive? Wouldn't it be great, I have four kids, if they could meet their grandchildren? As I'm doing this, I'm looking at one of those street camps. And I think to myself, what would I do right now if I saw my parents on these street camps? Again, the what if, right? Now I took these two ideas and I mashed them together. A man and a woman happily married. One wife gets murdered. Eight years pass, he can't get over her death. He gets an email, he clicks a hyperlink, he sees a webcam, and his dead wife walks by. And little Homer Simpson partner goes, woo, you know, that's the moment. You start kicking like a dog, like you're being scratched right in that right area. Again, three months of work, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> three months. Okay, so the next thing you have to do, you have this sort of concept, these sort of ideas is, if, first of all, writers are a little bit like we of the Hebrew faith. Ask 10 of them how they do something, you get 11 different answers. So that keeping that in mind, um, every writer does it differently. I need to know the ending before I start. In every book, with the exception of one called The Woods, I knew the ending. The Woods had these four kids in the woods. I didn't know what was going on. I had to start the book about page 190. One of the characters was kind enough to tell me what's going on, because I was really getting lost. But normally, I know the beginning and I know the end. I compare it to driving from my hometown of, of Newark, New Jersey, just north of Washington, DC, across the United States over to, to LA. I may go Route 80, Chances are I'll go via the Suez Canal or stop in Tokyo, but I pretty much always end up in LA. E.L. Doctorow has my second favorite quote on writing. He says that writing is like driving at night in the fog with just your headlights on. You can only see a little bit ahead of you, but you can make the whole journey that way. The only thing I would add is I know the end of the journey. My very favorite quote on writing, and if you learn nothing else today, like you're learning something, <laughs> Um, my very favorite quote on writing, and the best writing advice I ever heard comes from the great Elmore Leonard, who said, think about this, I try to cut out all the parts you'd normally skip. <laughs> Is that not genius? 
And I try to do that. I try to remember that. On every page, every paragraph, every sentence, every word, I ask, is this compelling? Is this the best I can do? Is this gripping? And if it's not, I've got to find a way of changing it. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't mean you can't have themes or descriptions or the larger things are supposed to be in a novel. But every one of those has to be compelling. I write as though there's a knife against my throat, and if I bore you, I write as though we are cavemen, we're sitting around a cave, and if I bore you, this guy's going to pick up a club and whack me over the head with it. That's the kind of energy I try always to write with. You have to do that all the time if you can. All right, so where do we have next? Oh, let me give you an example of what I kind of mean by this, by the way, of getting rid of descriptions or whatever else. Mary Higgins Clark tells the story all the time also. Um, I'm a member of a group called the Adams Roundtable. A bunch of mystery writers we meet, we're supposed to meet once a month in New York for dinner, ends up being a lot less than that, but members, Mary Higgins Clark is a member, Lawrence Block, Lee Child, um, Nelson DeMille, Linda Fairstein, Susan Isaacs, a lot of great writers, very talented people. And one time the subject came up of what's the scariest noise in the world? A man being tortured, a woman crying, a baby screaming. What's the scariest noise in the world? And one of our members goes, no, 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 no. The scariest noise in the world is you're all alone in a cabin in the woods. You know you're all alone. You're all alone in a cabin. No one else is there. And from upstairs, you hear the toilet flush. <laughs> That's the moment you're always looking for as a writer. The flush toilet moment, if you will. So for setting, for example, if I'm describing to you Route 23 in Wayne, New Jersey. By the way, in New Jersey, for some reason, we have a lot of mattress stores. Do you have that down here in DC too? We have like Sleepy's, which is the mattress professional. And I always wonder, is that an M MBA program? Is that a JD? How many years is to become a mattress professional? Anyway, but if I'm describing to you Route 23 in Wayne, New Jersey, I won't tell you it's four lanes across the divider in the middle, or, but I'll find the one thing. So for example, on Route 23 in Wayne, New Jersey, there's a tattoo parlor called, think about this, Tattoos while you wait. <laughs> like, how else would you do it? Here's my arm. Put a little snake on there. I'll be back around three. That'll tell you more than pages and pages of dialogue or description on Route 23 in Wayne, New Jersey. Also in New Jersey, we're fairly honest people. I'm not going to knock some of you who are from close to this area, but I was doing an event not too far from here where the people kept telling me when you go to the event, you're going to cross the Great Bridge. Wait till you see the Great Bridge. You're going to love the Great Bridge. Keep in mind, I live near the George Washington Bridge. The Great Bridge is about the length of this room. Why don't you go to the little piece of crap bridge? <laughs> we have a motel in Route 17 in Ramsey, New Jersey, one of those no-tell motels. Thank you, sir, for nodding. Um, <laughs> has a sign saying, now featuring towels. You know? And then also, my favorite sign, color TV, like some people have black and white still. And the color is always spelled out, like the C is in green, the O is in red, the L is in yellow. Like we don't know what the word color is, right? <laughs> but I love this, because the name of this hotel, this motel in, uh, in Route 17, is the Fair Motel. We're not great, we're not even good. We're fair. What do you want for an hourly rate? That again will tell you more about New Jersey than pages and pages of dialogue. Oh, one more thing. Sometimes with ideas, anger is a great way of coming up with an idea. Okay, so I wrote a book called Just One Look a few years ago. I'm sorry to get off course, I'll get back. Remind me, I'm on research. Okay, but I just want to, because, so um, I'm writing this book, Just One Look, and the idea for Just One Look came, I was picking up the family photos at a photo mat. Remember those things, guys? Some of you are old enough to remember those. So I'm going through the pictures in the envelope, and for a second, just a split second, I thought there was a picture in there I didn't take. It turns out the picture was just upside down. Oh, but I had the idea, what if there was a picture in that envelope I didn't take? What if that picture changed my life, okay? But then you ask who's gonna tell the story. And for the first time, I wanted a woman to tell the story because I had been reading a really bunch, a ton of really bad women in Jeopardy novels. You know the ones I'm talking about? where the heroine is like naive to the point of mental arthritis. <laughs> it's like, gee, there's a serial killer loose in the woods. I think I'll rent a secluded cab and not tell anybody where I'm going, hook up a, not hook up a phone line, and hang out in my brawn panties all day. I mean, people, please. <laughs> in today's society, for us to still be putting up with that sort of thing. Um, so you guys, you guys, I'm sure, probably know that there's a movie, um, I, when I'm on, on the road, we just change people. 
I'm really going to throw you, I'm going to really throw you off now by talking to you. I'm sorry, I'll forget you're here. Okay, so, but to, to, when I'm talking about this Women in Jeopardy thing, so I'm flipping along stations because I'm a guy in the hotel room when I'm on tour, and I always go past the Lifetime Movie Network, and I'm not making this up, there's been a remake of it, but I used to tell a story and people wouldn't believe me. But um, I, I've seen this movie that was starring, was it Meryl Streep? No, it was Tori Spelling. I always mix those two up, Tori Spelling or, <laughs> and Meryl Streep. But this was, this was, this was, this was Tori Spell Spelling, not Meryl Streep. And the name of the movie, some of you have probably seen this, is Mother May I Sleep with Danger. No! <laughs> this should be an awfully short movie, shouldn't it? Right? First of all, his name's Danger. Clue one, he might not be for you. Anyway, that anger, that wanting to not have a story like that, that wanting to have a heroine who is real, not the kind who goes, ooh, the serial killer's at the door. Honey, go get the door. Mommy's going to take a shower. <laughs> Will inspire you sometimes to write something better. Okay, so this setting, oh, research, thanks. Research, I'm on research. Hold on. So you've seen writers here, right? And they all talk probably about research, do a ton of research. If you're a writer in a room, my advice to you is do zero research, none. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> I'm going to defend that position now. Okay, two reasons. First of all, have you ever read that novel where the author's done a ton of research and he keeps throwing in cute tidbits that he learned because it slowed the story down? Not a problem with me because I don't know anything. Okay. <laughs> Second reason, a more important reason, research is more fun than writing. So you will use research as an excuse not to write. I see a lot of people nodding their heads right now. So it'll be like, I gotta write a scene in Fifth Avenue, New York. Oh, but I can't write it today. I have to go back and smell the hot dog stands and watch the girls go by. No, you have an imagination. You've probably been there. You could look at pictures, write it now, and then worry about the exact research later on. Don't let anything be an excuse not to write. Following on that, there's three things that make a writer. And we'll go through that in a second. Well, three things. Two are obvious. One is not so obvious. The two that are obvious are inspiration. Well, duh. You need to be inspired to write. So let's just move that aside. The second is perspiration, and that is doing the writing. And only writing is writing. Researching is not writing. Creating characters is not writing. Thinking of ideas is not writing. Outlining is not writing. Buying a new notepad is not writing. Going out with your friends to Starbucks, eavesdropping. None of those are writing. <laughs> only writing is writing. Only putting actual words on a piece of paper or on a computer screen count as writing. Everything else is flotsam and jetsam and nonsense. So I don't, the only thing that counts is your butt in a chair producing words, okay? So we have, oops, excuse me, we have inspiration and we have perspiration. But the third and most important thing a writer has to have is desperation. And that is I'm not fit to do anything else. <laughs> like hold a real job. I do have shoes. I forgot to bring the socks. I'm forgetful, I'm disorganized, I'm sloppy, I have a tendency to drift off, I go to Never Never Land all the time, I go to Fiction Land, I'm not good at anything else. I was once on a panel with a bunch of other authors, and we often get the question, if you weren't an author, what would you be? And one of my friends says, a U.S. Senator. I'm like, oh, please. <laughs> I'd be a duvet cover. I mean, this is it. <laughs> this is all I got. And that fear, that worry, that insecurity is what drives me back, to, to quote Steve Martin's old line, being afraid that I'll have to wake up at 6 in the morning and go to the pharmacy and have to sell flare pens for a living or whatever it is. That fear drives me back still to this day. Writing is about fear. I'm going to drop name drop right now. I had breakfast this morning with Stephen King. And <laughs> we both discussed the fact that we still feel, because I was like, all right, I feel it, but insecure. We, we, we writers never stop feeling insecure. I'll be writing my book, like, okay, I'm writing my book, and I'll be going, oh my God, I lost it. I was so good before. <laughs> what happened to me? How did I lose it? Five minutes later, this is sheer genius. <laughs> Someone's going to read that, give that, read that air book and not give this work of Shakespearean proportions really a chance. Five minutes. Happens within five minutes of one another. When I finish a book, I sound like one of those game show hosts, the, the voiceovers. That's it for you, Harlan. There's no more ideas left. You're going to get a real job, and here's some turtle wax to go along with your new career. Every book, same thing. I've written 30 books. 30 books, one about one a year. So I started when I was seven. Now, <laughs> 
Yeah, I wish. Um, but that never goes away, that fear. The muse is not an angelic voice on your shoulder singing beautifully. It's your mom. What, you don't want to be with me? You'd rather be out with your friends? Come a Friday night, no phone call, nothing? That's what it's there all the time. And if you're a writer, there's, you always feel guilty. Even when I'm reading, I love to read. But even when I'm reading, I feel guilty I'm not writing. There's always a voice in my head that says, you should be home writing. If you don't have that voice, you're probably not a writer. And that's cool, I don't need the competition, seriously. <laughs> but there's always that voice. Recently, um, because I have nothing else in my life other than my family and writing, I took up golf. Why didn't smash a glass, pick up a shard, and jam it straight in my eye? I don't know. <laughs> Instead, I took the less pleasurable route of taking up golf. But even on those days when it's beautiful out and I'm doing okay and hitting the ball, there's still always a voice in my head that says, you should be writing. Usually it's the guy I almost did with my Aaron T shot also. Um, another question, I'm gonna give you, another question that writers often get is, what's the bad part about being a best-selling author? You know, what's the, what's the bad part? And I'm here to tell you, nothing. It's as good as you imagine it is. It's awesome. And anybody who has, that's bad karma, man, to say anything negative about being a best-selling author because it's really the best. And for me, the other thing writers say that annoy me, and if you're one of those writers in the room that says this, I'm calling you out as a liar, okay? Or someone in need of therapy. My, the, okay, here it is. The thing that writers say that really annoys me, have you ever heard of this? I write only for myself. I don't care if anyone reads it. That's like saying, I talk only to myself. I don't care if anyone listens. From the beginning of time, since we could scrap, oh look, I'm over there. It's hard to capture my raw animal magnetism in photography, people. You're better off looking here. No, from the beginning of time, since men could write on cave walls, writing has been about communication, right? That's what it's about. So, uh, Berkeley's Tree in the Woods, if, if I write a book and no one reads it, I don't exist as a writer. You know, this just came out. A writer without a reader is a man who claps with one hand. I said clap, sir. Claps with one hand. You're the other hand. So this is the part that's fun for me. I'm throwing the ball, you're catching it. Um, there's an Arab expression that when one man dies, a whole universe dies. When one of you reads this book, a whole new universe of Myron and Wynne and Esperanza and Big Cindy comes to life differently than everybody else's. A one-on-one -on -one connection between you and me. That, frankly, is the coolest thing in the world to me. And the fact that I get to do this, and I get to meet you guys who are reading the books, that's, otherwise, otherwise, what's the point? You know, I mean, that's the magic of why you're here, why we're talking about books today at this thing. Books still do that, man. What else still does that, that spurs the imagination? that moves you, enlightens you, entertains you? What else changes lives? I was asked today about literacy. And people are giving great answers about how literacy, you need to fill out job forms and the whole economic reason. But I'm just thinking, imagine your favorite books right now. Imagine your life or how intelligent you would be if you never had a chance to read those. So I want to thank you all for listening to me today. And I would be happy to entertain, if not answer, a few of your questions. Thank you all very, very much. Thanks. We got about 10 minutes for some questions if you want. Everyone's running out rather than running to the microphone. This is not a good sign. Remember I said I would just call on you. Yes. Dad, Go ahead. I have two questions I'm very interested in. Yes. Second one you might have to answer at book signing so it doesn't give it away. Okay. And then one I'm not quick. answering any, so I'm no spoilers. Go ahead. No, okay. Here's so I have to tell you, I recently reread this book I was completely fooled by the ending. <laughs> it's that stunning an ending. I'm telling you, none of you are going to guess the ending of this book. I cried completely. at the end. Oh, good. I want you to cry. You're yeah. supposed to cry. Good, good, good. Quick question. Yeah. You usually write a book once a year, and yep. now it's only been six months. Will this be a pattern? No. <laughs> no. Wrong answer. My publishers aren't listening, are they? No. This year, um, I, for some reason, it's hard to explain, I did two. Um, I had the idea for the Myron Bolotar, which is my first one in five years, very, very quickly. And um, I just, wrote, I just be I became obsessed with it and was at it, wrote it fast enough. They said, ooh, can we get this done by now? I'm like, yeah, I think we can. 
Okay. This one's not a spoiler okay. because it, right in the beginning you see that Wynn is not with the company. Yeah. What was Myron doing after selling the company for all that time till Wynn got back? I don't know. <laughs> no, you know, I'm not, I, don't re, I don't respond to anything in his life that's not necessarily in the book, but thank you for asking. <laughs> Gentlemen over here, thank you. Yeah, what a pleasure it is. Um, you've talked about how you come up with your ideas for stories and things. Uh, you also come up with some very frightening characters in your books. Um, do you have a, uh, are those something you are always thinking of as well? Uh, particularly, tell one, no one, uh, Eric Wu was uh, particularly, particularly uh, frightening. But, Thanks. Uh, just curious about how you come up with those. Just the, the same <laughs> as regular people, just a little bit, you know, you just got to twist them just a little bit. All my friends, by the way, always think that the cool guys are based on them, right? All my friends are like, that guy gets all the chicks. That's me, right? <laughs> they never go, that loser with halitosis. That's me, right? They never think that. Yes, over here. So in a, in a lot of your books, uh, there seems to be someone that's lost, mm -hmm. someone that people are looking for. And I, I was wondering if there was anything in your life that had kind of propelled this idea into your books. Um, yeah, I love, I prefer missing people um, because with missing people, there's hope. If somebody's dead, they're dead. You're just solving a crime. With missing people, they could still be alive. There was a time in my life before I was 40, I had um, done seven eulogies, including my, both my parents, um, even before I was 35, seven, yeah. So I had a lot of loss and it probably is part of the reason why I'm trying to find a way to, to bring back the dead. Right, that was deep. Give me a moment. <laughs> yes. I'm a student of French. I started about 10 years ago. Oh, I hear your French accent. It's oh, quite absolutely. thick. Oh, yeah. Really, really, <laughs> really good one. Um, so I've been going to Paris for the last 10 years once a year. And I thought I might as well pick up a book that the French people are reading. And each time it was a Harlan Coben. Yeah, I'm big in France. I'm the Jerry Lewis of crime you're, fiction. You're, you're very <laughs> I'm you're hoping very... Germany will pick up so I can be a David Hasselhoff also. <laughs> But right now, it's just the French, yeah. They're very big. Yeah. And they're an easy read. I didn't need a dictionary. Everything was fabulous until I hit one. And it was clunky. I couldn't read it. In, I didn't finish it. And I hope it, this is going somewhere nice. No. <laughs> I won't tease you. Go ahead. I, looked, I thought, what is the difference with this book? And it was translated by a different person. Ah. Um, do you ever think that your books rise or fall on a translator? It's pretty simple. If the book's doing well in a country, I assume the translator's good. <laughs> and if it's doing poorly, I blame the translator. Cool. It's actually exactly, it's which, all of that. It's all based. Which is exactly what I did. Exactly based on translator. I once got my Japanese translator once sent me a copy of the book and he, he said, if there's anything in this translation you don't like, be sure to let me know. <laughs> this symbol doesn't capture what I'm trying to say. Let's do two more questions, then I'll go down and sign books as fast as I can. Yes, thank you. First of all, I love yes. your adult series books, Thank you. Um, but I'm an eighth grade teacher yes. and there's a whole new generation with the shelter series that they, we can't keep them on our shelf. That's so they sweet. Love Thank them. you. Is there going to be more? Well, I will tell you that I think the kids are a little probably old enough. Mickey, Ema, and Spoon are all in this book and we've learned a big secret about one of their lives. I don't think I'm going to go back to the young adult novel for a while. I wrote it as a trilogy and I'm just so busy right now, I'm doing two TV shows overseas also, that I don't think I'm gonna have a chance to do Young Adult. But just give it to them again and tell them I never read it. <laughs> oh, that only well, works, with, that only works with the older readers. I year, that every September. The old, that's right, that works with the older readers, it doesn't work with the young ones. One last, or two last, both of these two and then we're done. Yes, thank you. Um, could you address the business side, agents and publishers, and give us just a... They're all whores. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, could, could, yeah, could you sure. dig, dig a little deeper? In the, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've, I've, I've been very, very lucky. All the people I've worked with have been fantastic. All the rumors you hear about, like, that they want you to have more sex in the books or violence in the books. Each one of my books, by the way, has less sex than the one before, which also reflects my reality. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Um, not really. Uh, <laughs> but... Um, I've had nothing but great relationships with my editors and agents. Uh, find ones you trust. Um, I'm a, I really could not do it. Everyone who works for me, like I, whenever I hire somebody, I tell them that their job, 
is just thinking, what can I do to, to free Harlem up to write? All I want to do is write. I don't know about e-books, I don't know about Amazon or Barnes and Noble and the evils and sign this. I just like, when, as soon as I hear it, I go like this, la la la, I can't hear you. <laughs> I know, what it makes me do is it makes me just write harder. I put my head down, because the only thing I can control is my book. I can't control my Amazon ranking. I can control how good the next book is going to be. And if that book is good enough, you guys will read it on stone tablets. So I don't have to worry about what e-book or audio. I try really to be as naive as I can about the business end. Does that help at all? Yes. Oh, thank thanks. You. Just write, man. I'm just telling you. The only answer is to always to write. Yeah. First of all, thank question. you for hours of enjoyment. Thank I, you. I really, really. Thank you. Oh, that's thank you. that's very sweet of you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was honor. curious why why your books haven't been turned into movies, and 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 if they ever are, yeah. Who who would play Milan? Um, well, Tell No One was made into a, a, was mentioned in the introduction, a really, really good French movie. It was nominated for nine of their Oscars. It won four. Um, for those of you who have seen it, I'm in it for about eight seconds in the background. I'm following Kristen Scott Thomas and Francois Clizet. Like I said, about eight seconds, no line. But I was brilliant, really. I, I stole the film. I was ripped off of a Best Supporting Actor nomination. I'm assuming the French are anti-Semitic. I don't know. I don't need an excuse for it. Um, I did a TV show this year in England called The Five. Uh, I did uh, No Second Chance in France. Tell No One it has a chance of being made again as an American remake. Fool Me Once I'm working on right now with Julia Roberts. I love saying that. I'm working on with Julia Roberts. Like the two of us are just hanging out working on this movie. I'm writing the screenplay for now. I, uh, it's a weird, Hollywood's a weird and destructive animal and it's hard to really explain. Other than to say that uh, I'm not too worried about it because at the end of the day there's always a this old, old James Cain line, um, when I asked him, don't you hate what Hollywood's done to your books? He said, they did nothing to buy books. They're right there on the shelf. Thanks, everybody, very much. I'll see you downstairs. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.